Racavina is a drug discovery company developing a new cancer treatments based on novel DDR or DNA damage response inhibitors. The company just announced that it received a short list of drug candidates generated by the proprietary deep docking AI platform, which has dramatically accelerated the first steps of Racavina's drug discovery pathway. Executive Chair Jeffrey Batcha is here to explain what this all means in the upcoming steps and milestones for the company and its development of cancer therapies. I'm Martin Gagel with Market Radius Research. It's Thursday, October the 24th. Please remember this is neither a recommendation nor investment advice. Jeffrey, thanks for joining us. How are things going? Thank you, Martin. Um, things are things are going well. We're, we're very excited to have achieved this milestone. Um, ju just to summarize, um, the deep docking platform and our collaboration with Professor Art Cherkasov at the University of British Columbia um, gives us exclusive access to what is arguably one of the most robust medicinal chemistry, drug discovery, AI-driven platforms in the world. And we've been working um, with Professor Cherkasov and the platform for a few months. And over that period of time, we were able to screen literally billions of potential structures against our target. Um, it's sort of like a mining exercise where you know the real estate you're interested in, that's the target, uh, a biological target in a cancer cell. And we wanna inhibit that and we wanna do it with a new molecule that is as good or better, hopefully better than what anybody else is developing. And so we announced uh, just the other day that we had received from that mining effort a short list of recommended small molecule drug candidates that we are going to now um, synthesize and validate in our labs. So it's a it's a big step for us, and um, it's it's just an amazing opportunity to use modern technology and hopefully do some wonderful things for cancer patients. The whole AI revolution is bringing about developments like this, not just uh, writing emails for us. And that normally, how would uh, scientists be developing these initial drug candidates? And, and what would the normal length of time and cost be associated with that? And you seem to do this, I believe it was in like five months, which uh, right. seems fairly yeah. uh, uh, dramatic. It, it, it is, it is, we believe, game changing. Um, so, you know, typically... Um, drug discovery and lead optimization is a trial and error process where you kind of go back and forth. You start with the target you're interested in, and you find a, a lead molecule um, that binds to that target. And then you work on turning that into something that looks like a drug, something that can get to the tumor, that can uh, hang around in the body long enough, that isn't going to hit other places in the body and cause side effects and toxicity. And that's generally an iterative process of two steps forward and one step back and sometimes one step forward and three steps back you're just sort of going de novo and you know a good chemist can make a certain and analyze a certain number of compounds um, every month for example but what was done with the ai platform the deep docking platform to to look at billions of structures if you had a team of a thousand chemists it would take tens of thousands of years to accomplish the same thing. Literally impossible. So this is this is game changing. Um, we believe that it levels the playing field between us and, and big pharma um, and also you know, potentially gives us a competitive advantage in looking at all of the potential molecular structures that we can, which is greater than you could do with with traditional means. Um, you asked about how much how much would be invested traditionally. Um, you know, a, a large pharmaceutical company would look at several million uh, compounds over um, the course of many years, and they'd invest you know, somewhere on the order of 10, 10 to $20 million to find that right molecule that um, uh, they would want to take into human clinical trials. Smaller companies, of course, are limited with resources. We, we wouldn't look at that many, but to literally be able to look at billions of potential structures in a matter of uh, about 16 weeks um, is, we believe, game changing. And we're really excited to uh, receive this short list of recommended structures that we're now going to uh, synthesize and validate in the labs. The, the computer output that says these are the structure the, or the chemical structures of what you, you, you should take to the next level. So you're getting them synthesized, actual chemicals produced in a lab. Right. 
and then you're going to take them to your labs and uh, up at UBC and then do the more traditional work of test tubes and that sort of a thing to see which of that short list uh, is actually the best uh, candidate. Is, is that right? Correct. So over the next, well, this is beginning right now where we have, we have chemistry partners, um, one being farm inventor here in Vancouver, who's a, who's a wonderful group to work with. Um, we give them the list and they start making them one by one. And over the next three to six months, we'll basically make all of the ones that are on the list. Um, as they come in in real time, we're not going to wait six months, but in the next few weeks, we'll get the, the first several and we'll keep going from there. We bring those into our labs at the University of British Columbia, which is a wonderful infrastructure. We have all of the capabilities to test these in terms of cell based assays, in terms of toxicity, in terms of animal models to really take that short list and find the best ones. And one of those classes of molecules, um, and we're going to patent several of them, uh, we'll look at partnering with uh, larger companies to move into human clinical trials. Roughly, like you can't give a precise date, but it, how many months or quarters do you expect to come down to your filtering out that short list into your top one or two uh, candidates? Is that a couple of months, a couple of years, or what? Well, like like I said, it's, it's uh, you know, me about four to six months of, of chemistry synthesis. Um, and, you know, we would like to, to look at most of these. Um, but as we go forward, you know, as, as uh, you know, we're going to start with the, the top ranked molecules, if you will. Um, and if we find one that hits all the, all the right spots, um, which the computer suggests that they will in terms of uh, met metabolic profile, in terms of safety profile, pharmacokinetics um, on target versus off target, uh, bindings. All of those things were used in the algorithm to create this shortlist. And so we expect um, great activity out of out of the shortlist. And like I said, our goal is to uh, develop a best in class next generation DNA damage response inhibitor. And these are the kinds of, of, of programs that big pharma uh, is keenly interested in. And um, so we're, we're looking at uh, the potential of of licensing and partnering early in the life cycle to really advance these quickly into human clinical trials. So once you have your top candidate or two, then you're going to try to license that out, find partnerships to the heavy lifting or for investors, you, you do your um, investigational new uh, drug candidate and submit that application. Would you partner before your IND or after you submit it or, or that kind of depends? I so it, it's it's very interesting. A, a lot in a lot of cases, um, the bigger companies want to see something in clinical trials before they they partner. Yeah. In the DNA damage response space, we have seen multiple blockbuster level uh, licensing deals for preclinical compounds. Um, every big pharma has a robust um, DNA damage response research and development program. They're looking for the next best thing, um, you know, to bring forward. And we believe we can deliver that to them. And given that interest and given the history of preclinical licensing, um, I, I would expect that there will be opportunities there. Um, these aren't conversations that are going to start uh, when we have the right candidate. You can imagine that um, um, when we announced the collaboration with Professor Cherkasov last April, that we uh, reached out to the companies that we know well and said, hey, this is what we're planning to do. Um, we are now in a position to say we've taken a big next step in receiving the shortlist um, and we'll actually be presenting some initial data at the Society for Neuro-Oncology annual meeting uh, next month and all of those companies will be there. So we'll be able to showcase where we are and where we're heading and continue those conversations toward uh, what we hope will be a, a, a very uh, important and impactful um, partnership with one of them. So drug development is notoriously very expensive. You've raised some money recently. How far do you expect your balance sheet and your runway? To what major milestones do you can you do you have a pathway for? Well, we've we've got working capital to you know hit the next milestones, um, but it's always nice um, to look at opportunities to further bolster the treasury. Um, you can imagine that um, in negotiations with a larger party, if you have a strong balance sheet, you're going to better negotiating position and you can get a better deal. 
So we're always looking for for opportunities there. Um, we've been very lucky to have very supportive shareholders who have um, uh, continued to invest in the company. And as we go forward, we will we will look at uh, continuing that path. So just in simplified terms, what are the next milestones or news releases or types of things should investors be expecting over the next couple months and quarters? What to keep our eyes open for? Well, I mean, certainly conference presentations of the data as it comes forward. We've always taken the practice of presenting our new data in a peer-reviewed setting. So while, you know, a lot of, I mean, biotechnology is complicated, pharmaceuticals is complicated, the science is complicated, but being able to present data in a peer-reviewed setting so that everybody knows that a panel of experts had vetted the data before we presented it and invited us to present that, um, certainly I believe gives some some validation. So conference presentations as we go into, into the year, uh, certainly, you know, uh, announcements about patents on these new classes of, of potential best in class compounds. Um, and then, you know, obviously we're looking for um, partnership and licensing transaction, which, um, you know, in, in mid to the second half of 2025, um, we believe that we'll have data to support that. Anything else to comment on before we wrap it up here, Jeffrey? Well, I really appreciate uh, your continued interest in what we're doing. Um, the DNA damage response field is, is um, it's a very important area of, of research in cancer. Uh, we've really just scratched the surface of it with the first generation products, which have become very important in the treatment of certain types of breast, ovarian, and prostate cancer. But like any new technology, um, when it comes out, it's, it's profound, it's game changing. But then you learn things and you learn what you could do better. You look, learn how you can advance the field. And we're very pleased to be you know, right front and center with our, with, uh, with our peers in uh, advancing the field toward next generation DNA damage response inhibitors that, you know, frankly, DNA damage response pathways and the defects in them are responsible for about three, three out of every four cancers. So this is a, a huge opportunity to make a difference for patients, and we're excited to be part of it. All right. Well, that's great. Hopefully uh, wishing you all the best success for, for everyone's benefit. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Uh, great to get the update. Looking forward to seeing the follow-up news and have a great day. Very good. Thank you, Martin. Have a great day.